get started. So it's my, my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to the afternoon panel. And as we did this morning, uh, we'll, I'll introduce each speaker separately, and then there will be questions and answers uh, for each speaker following uh, his respective paper. So uh, let me begin then the, the, uh, to introduce uh, our first speaker this afternoon, um, <coughs> Professor Robert Harrison, who's the Rosina per Perotti Professor of Italian Literature at Stanford University and the author of many books. Uh, and I particularly want to draw your attention to the book that's actually part of the program notes, Gardens, an Essay on the Human Condition, which is uh, Professor Harrison mentioned to me, uh, is an uh, engagement with Hannah Arendt. Um, he's a member of the, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He contributes to the New York Review of Books. And interestingly enough, uh, he has a radio program uh, called Entitled Opinions. And uh, you can find that uh, podcast of that radio show on the uh, 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 website. Now, I just have to mention, Robert, that uh, I'm particularly happy to hear that he, uh, there's a podcast of him and a former student of mine, actually my first dissertation student, Karen Feldman, uh, in a two-part uh, conversation uh, uh, on Hannah Arendt. So that promises to be a very, very good discussion. Um, the lecture that Professor Harrison will give this afternoon is Hannah Arendt, The Primacy of Appearance. So please welcome. Thank you all for coming. I, I would like to speak maybe more to the audience than to the panelists in my talk because I, uh, one has a tendency to speak to the specialists when you're uh, in a venue like this. but. I took the title of the conference literally and seriously with a question mark, like what is politics? And I am going to do my best to try to uh, convey my understanding of Hannah Arendt's conception of what is politics. And in the course of my preparing for today, uh, I would realize once again just how strange, idiosyncratic and bizarre is the concept of the political in Hannah Arendt's corpus. And I think that oftentimes we don't appreciate the extent to which that's the case because somehow through a very idiosyncratic idea of the political, she manages to get great yield in her analyses of particular instances in political history and so forth. Uh, so one of my uh, objectives today is to try to do what I believe she does as a thinker, which is go to the, to the actual ground of the matter at hand. And that's something that she does, whether she's talking about totalitarianism, or Eichmann in Jerusalem, or the desegregation laws in the South, the American South. She has a way of going to the very ground of the matter, to the essence of the matter, and I believe profoundly that this is something that she learned from Martin Heidegger. Um, and I don't know whether that scene in the movie that's going to be shown tomorrow uh, it, it's, it's factually true where she visits Heidegger as a young student in his office hour and says, I want you to teach me how to think. But I believe it must be, he, she must have asked him to do something like that. And he I think that what she learned from him was uh, a kind of practice of thinking that was typical of Heidegger in those pre Sein und Zeit years. We know from the transcripts of his lectures, those lecture courses, that he, when he got a hold of a topic, an author, or a text, he just probed and went to look at it from every kind of point of view and performed what he was understood as a phenomenological reduction of the issue at hand. Of course, he was doing it in a very unorthodox manner vis-a-vis uh, -vis the traditional Husserlian phenomenology, but nevertheless, this was the way he was practicing thinking to uh, get to the essence of the matter at hand, and, and I believe that there was an inheritance of this 
the part of Hannah Arendt in two respects. One is get to the ground, and the other is this emphasis on appearance that you had in Heidegger's courses at that time that was coming from his heavy involvement with phenomenology. And I cannot say that with certainty that the primacy of appearance, the title of my talk, which I believe um, it's impossible to understand what Hannah Arendt means by the political without understanding the way in which the political is an arena of appearance. I cannot say to what degree uh, that idea had its first uh, germs in, in the seminars where Heidegger obsessed with the whole question of being as a coming into appearance. Of course, for Heidegger, the process of coming into appearance, or fusis, uh, or aletheia, the disclosure of truth, is one that um, caused him to raise the question, well, what is it that does not come to appearance in that which appears? And this will be an interesting question for us to pursue here. So what I, if, with your permission, I'm going to quote uh, generously from her own uh, texts, and especially from an essay of hers in Beyond, uh, Between Past and Future, which is the essay, What is Freedom? Many of the essays in this collection are what is authority, what is freedom. What is, she doesn't have one of what is politics, but I believe that it's in that essay, what is freedom, that she answers the question, what is politics, uh, you know, most essentialistically or, or phenomenologically. And in fact, she says that the, the raison d'être politics is freedom, and freedom is primarily experienced in action. So the raison d'être of politics is freedom, and freedom is primarily experienced in action. And she goes on to say that before it became an attribute of thought or a quality of will, freedom was understood to be the free man's status, which enabled him to move, to get away from home, to go out into the world and meet other people in deed and word. This freedom clearly was preceded by liberation, Hence, going back to the discussion uh, with, I was having earlier with Peg about the relationship between freedom and liberation, uh, but we can get back to that maybe in, in the Q&A. But clearly, her concept of freedom is one that presupposes liberation and the company of other free men. Uh, in order to be free, man must have liberated himself from the necessities of life, but the status of freedom did not follow automatically upon that act of liberation. Freedom needed, in addition to mere liberation, the company of other men who were in the same state, and it needed a common public space to meet them, a politically organized world, in other words, into which each of the free men could insert himself by word and deed. Therefore, Plurality, the company of other men, is a necessary component of freedom, just as is this public space in which freedom can make an appearance. Uh, she goes on to, later to say that freedom as inherent in action is perhaps best illustrated by Machiavelli's concept of virtu, of virtue, um, and says that the meaning of virtus is best rendered by virtuosity, that is, an excellence we attribute to the performing arts as distinguished from the creative arts of making. And here in the last talk we heard about Martin, I think he was speaking about the difference between the creative arts and the performing arts. The creative art, uh, the creative arts is a form of activity in which the artist's work in, in creating the art does not appear uh, as part of the process. It's only the final product which appears. It could be the statue, the poem, or something else. As opposed to the performing arts, where um, the accomplishment lies in the performance itself and not in an end product which outlasts the activity that brought it into existence and becomes independent of it. And here we get the emphasis on appearance. 
She says, the point here is not whether the creative artist is free in the process of creation, but that the creative process is not displayed in public and not destined to appear in the world. Hence, the element of freedom, certainly present in the creative arts, remains hidden. It is not the free creative process which finally appears or matters for the world. The performing arts, on the contrary, have indeed a strong affinity with politics. And here, I think, in the discussion, we can discuss to what extent this is a true kind of aesthetics of politics, or whether she's just using art and aesthetics as an analogy for politics. I believe the latter myself more than the former. However, performing artists, dancers, play actors, musicians, and the like, need an audience to show their virtuosity, just as acting men need the presence of others before whom they can appear. Both need a publicly organized space for their work, and both depend upon others for the performance itself. And here, then, we have um, the conclusion as regards the relation of freedom to politics. Uh, we, we understand the political in the sense of the police, the city, uh, its end or raison d'être would be to establish and keep in existence a space where freedom as virtuosity can appear. So um, it's an arena. And here, you know, the question is what exactly does Hannah Arendt mean when she says that it's the space where freedom itself appears, what actually um, comes to appearance when freedom becomes active, becomes a form of action? To conclude this part of you know, my uh, reconstruction, I'll just uh, mention something that she says against liberalism um, that has banished, liberalism among other movements in, in political history have banished, she says, uh, the notion of liberty from the political realm. For politics, according to that philosophy, must be concerned almost exclusively with the maintenance of life and the safeguarding of its interests. So this is a very strong prejudice that I think many of us share today, that the business of government is really to, as she says, um, where life is at stake, all action is by definition under the sway of necessity, and the proper realm to take care of life's necessities is the gigantic and still increasing sphere of social and economic life whose administration has overshadowed the political realm ever since the beginning of the modern age. And here is that her concept of the social, I believe, which is that in something intermediate between the private sphere and the public sphere. And in the, in the kind of most purest sense of the political, it would be something highly isolated from those other two realms and would be like the, a, the performing arts, something where uh, men and women would engage, would have their voices heard in significant speech, as Peg was saying, and significant action whatever action, whatever form that action takes. Most often it takes the form of speech, having your voice heard. That is the place where the political is, would be isolated. And her, um, where she gets into trouble by her critics, even, the, even the, the best disposed critics, is the fact that it's so difficult to separate this very highly defined and delimited space of the political from the social and the economic and, of course, sometimes this leads to misunderstandings about the, the uh, uh, relationship that the political in Hannah Arendt has with government. The political is not government. And as long as we fail to keep that in mind, then we're not going to make sense of her philosophy of appearance, that the political is a phenomenon. It's that which comes into appearance, or it's where action in the political sense of action you know, makes its appearance. So, uh, in The Life of the Mind, one of the last work that she was working on, of course, something very interesting from my point of view happens to this thinking of the, of the relationship between the political and the space of, the political as a space of appearance. And that's that 
whereas before, the political was strictly a human phenomenon, and that it was, even within the human realm, it was highly restricted to those people who had the privilege of being free citizens, or being citizens of, you know, of a republic. In any case, certainly not universal. In fact, if you look at how many uh, governments or st uh, societies in history had a true political realm, from Hannah Arendt's point of view, very few. It was the Greek city-states, if not all of them, Athens, maybe Athens, Rome to a certain extent, and maybe, maybe some of the uh, modern republics. But by certainly these are exceptions, and they're not a universal human role. The funny thing about the life of the mind is that now she begins to <coughs> talk about appearance as something that is not only that pertains not only to the human but pertains also to all of nature. Anything that is sentient not only is able to perceive appearances but itself appears. And here I would relate this to what Martin was uh, when he was invoking Merleau Ponty about the flesh as something that is object and subject at the same time. She uses that same terminology uh, that an appearing thing also has to be capable of perceiving appearance. So it cannot just be a, a subject, it is also an object. So here is where I, I'll, uh, I'll just read a few uh, remarks that she makes in that, and then I will uh, try to indicate to you why I find uh, some of this problematic. How much time do I have on this? So I can Okay, let me just read a few things that she says in the, in the first chapter, which is uh, the world as appearance and the life, of the, uh, the life of the mind and the thinking thing. And uh, there she says, being and appearing coincide. And it goes on to say, in contrast to the inorganic thereness of lifeless matter, living beings are not mere appearances. To be alive means to be possessed by an urge towards self-display which answers the fact of one's own appearingness. Living things make their appearance like actors on a stage set for them. So she recuperates that language of acting or stage or arena. And now it is open to all of nature. And this idea of the urge to self-display, uh, I think that a book that Hannah Arendt read uh, I don't know when she read it, I just don't know her biography that well, but, I, but it makes an appearance here in the, uh, this chapter, uh, did a lot to get her to give a ground for, an ontological ground for her theory of appearance or her philosophy of appearance. And um, this is a, um, well, here's an image that I want you to keep in mind. And, what I'm going to uh, go through with you here, discussing this Adolf Portman. And those of you who are more specialists in Hannah Arendt than I am may be able to tell me that, well, there's a few articles that have been written about Hannah Arendt and Portman. And say, I haven't read them, if there are. So let me just reconstruct for you this, the, the, uh, the theories that she encountered in this book by Adolf Hochmann, who was a Swiss zoologist, who in the late 40s, early, already, I think it was 49 or 51, he published uh, this book about the study of the appearance of animals. Uh, excuse me? In 1949, I believe, was the original publication in German. She was the publisher. Yeah, she, and she cites it in the English <coughs> She what? In the, human, discusses in the human condition. In the human condition. So therefore, she read it early on. She she yes, 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 yes. And I know, but this is we're talking about this. This is the American edition. So and that came out uh, did not come out in 1949. The American edition. So she probably got it published. Got it translated. She could have gotten. She probably got it translated. I don't know. She. It's uh, listen. I discovered Portman by reading Hannah Arendt. And I thought it was quite interesting because she only has a paragraph or two, two or three paragraphs in the life of the mind. But I thought the thesis of Portman was very interesting. So I went and read the book. 
And I can tell you there's a lot more in the book than what she uh, you know, reveals just yeah, in those few paragraphs. Excuse me? Her copy with notes is in the library. Is it? In, yeah, Bard? Yeah. Well, that's great. Though. Well, as I said, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, um, I don't know what her notes say. I don't know what her reading of Portman uh, you know, was. I don't know how important this was. I have a feeling it's very important for the following reasons. Uh, to begin with, she says in that Life of the Mind that when it comes to the relationship between being and appearing, the Western metaphysical tradition is uh, uh, early on with Plato uh, started favoring the ground over the appearance. Uh, and this idea of the ground is one that she says all things that come to appearance, especially in plant life, they they come out of a ground, literally, in plant life. When it's human beings or animals, mammals, so forth, uh, they go through the birthing process before they're actually born into the world. So there is some matrix out, out of, from which appearances arise. And metaf the metaphysical tradition has looked at the world of appearances and always said there's something more important, more substantial, more basic, and has uh, privileged that over the actual appearance. She uh, also says that science has, con has inherited this metaphysical uh, uh, hierarchy by looking always also at behind appearances, dissecting through them in order to understand the inner mechanisms that, uh, of the life process and so forth. And uh, that's where, you know, if we go back to this uh, image of the dove, you, 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 you'll find that um, the functionalistic account for the appearance of the bird is that it covers over the inner reality of the bird's organic nature and that the whole function of the appearance is to promote the, uh, the survival and preservation and reproduction of the inner, uh, the inner organs or the inner life process. And that in, inner reality of the organism is identified with the intake of food and the demands of self-preservation, the preservation of the species. And then recently, uh, you know, it's gone even much further than that. So someone like Richard Dawkins, you know, the, uh, he's gone so far as to call all living species mere survival machines for in, individual molecules that inside these machines go about their business of self-replication. I can quote Dawkins if you don't believe me, <laughs> these replicators are in you and me. They created us, body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. They have come a long way, those replicators. Now they go by the name of genes, and we are their survival machines. Now, I've always found it near impossible to take, you know, Dawkins seriously, but Dawkins or no Dawkins, there is a pervasive dogma in biology today that the forms and appearances of animals are functions of the life process and that the external shape of the animal serves to conserve the inside apparatus through movement and intake of food, avoidance of enemies, and finding sexual partners. Again. I find this impossible to believe, and that's where Portman becomes you know, a kind of hero, not just for me, but also for Hannah Arendt. So in this book, he examines in exhaustive detail the appearance of many birds, mammals, plants, and finds that the functionalistic hypothesis, which reduces their appearance to the twofold purposes of self-preservation and preservation of the species, simply crumbles before the astonishing richness variety, and sheer superfluity of the forms of animal and plant life on Earth. He suggests with overwhelming phenom phenomenological evidence that the external appearance of species is not there to promote life processes, but on the contrary, that life processes exist in order to enable appearance. That living things do not appear in order to survive, but survive in order to appear. Portman does not deny the vital role of function. Instead, he argues, quote, prior to all functions for the purpose of the preservation of the individual and the species, we find the simple fact of appearing as self-display 
that makes those functions meaningful. The plumage of birds, for example, he says, quote, which at first we consider to be a value as a warm, protective covering is thus, in addition, so formed that its visible parts, and these only, build up a colored garment, the intrinsic worth of which lies solely in its visible appearance. And when he speaks of a simple crow's feather, he remarks, the tip is an iridescent bluish black, the lower part of silky down is light gray. It is as if a painter's brush had passed lightly over the ends of these insignificant looking mouse colored feathers so as to give them a beautiful sheen and outward show. The tip of each has its surface colored delicately. So it's only what was intended to appear that has this rich, variegated uh, articulation. It's another image of it. Now, Portman goes on how great a difference there may be between the visible and invisible parts of a single feather can be seen in the hummingbird's plumage of shivering colors. Here, the iridescence is produced according to the same optical laws as operate in the case of soap bubbles. In the feather, too, it depends on phenomena of interference in the thin lamellae. The iridescent lamellae develop an outermost delicate, colorless, horny layer on the finest part of the feather, the barbules. A reflecting surface is produced by the broadening of the individual barbules and their arrangement in the same direction. The color range of the iridescence is determined by the degree of fineness of the outermost membrane, so that one feather shows more of the red gold and another of the yellow green or blue violet parts of the spectrum. But all these special structures occur only on that part of the feather which is visible. There is no iridescence on the part which are covered up by the arrangement of the feathers. So you could say that by analogy, what Hannah Arendt understands as the political is really this <laughs> surface of appearance. It's this place of appearance where the, all the life processes, and that means our biological side, everything that falls under the category of labor, and perhaps even work in the vita activa, uh, are, are, are something that do not belong properly speaking to the, to the sphere of appearance. I, this is, I'm just speaking by analogy. Now, Portman's investigations led him to distinguish between authentic and inauthentic appearances. And Hannah Arendt makes a great deal about this in The Life of the Mind. Uh, so, the distinction would be between the visible veneers of animals and plants, which are meant to appear phenomenally, and the internal apparatuses that are never intended to be seen, such as the roots of plants and the inner organs of animals. Authentic appearances are finely differentiated, individuated, and variegated. So here uh, is an image of that. And on the whole, they observe principles of symmetry, whereas the inner organs of animals are clustered together in what seems like a haphazard disposition with none of the orderly patterns and subtle differentiations of the external surfaces. There is a distinct ugliness. That's Portman and Hannah Arendt. Uh, and non-differentiated quality to inauthentic appearances in general, precisely because they were never intended to show themselves. Whereas any of us can distinguish between one tiger and another tiger in a zoo, due to the differentiations of their hides and visible features, even trained biologists, when confronted with their inner organs, are often unable to tell the difference between a lion and a tiger, let alone individuals of either species. Now, why in Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein is Dr. Frankenstein so horrified when his creature first comes to life? Answer, because the creature is so ugly. But why is he so ugly? Is because the subsurface materiality of his organic being is visible in his 
countenance. Now, they don't do a very good job of it here with Boris Karloff in the, in the movie. Nevertheless, his exterior appearance does not hide but reveals the naked existence of the organic interior, which is identical to our own organic interior. Reading Shelley, his yellow skin scarcely covered the world of muscles and arteries beneath. Uh, but this doesn't quite convey the horror, but here are some images that do, that come from Honoré Fragonard, who was the brother of the famous painter Fragonard of the 18th century, and uh, he was a, a zoologist, and, and he flayed both animal and human figures, and they're still there, there's a little museum in Paris about these flayed figures, where you've taken off that external layer and then you see the, uh, what science would call the essence of the living thing, or which metaphysics would call the ground or the cause of the appearance or everything for which it's intended to uh, promote. And then I show you a picture of Elizabeth Slave, because what really horrifies Frankenstein about his creature is the eyeballs, which are murky, muddy, watery, and yellow, and dun. And they are the opposite of the beautiful eye that Edmund Burke exalted as the most beautiful part of the animal creation, quoting Burke, I think that the beauty of the eye consists first in its clearness. None are pleased with an eye whose matter, to use that term, is dull and muddy. And just so that we're gender neutral for all you women in the audience. <laughs> so, Hannah Arendt writes, whatever can see wants to be seen, whatever can hear calls out to be heard, whatever can touch presents itself to be touched. It is indeed as if everything that is alive has an urge to appear. What I find problematic, I find it's beautiful, but what I find problematic when it comes to understanding what is politics in Hannah Arendt is how then do you differentiate uh, the political in the human realm from everything else in the world of nature and in the world of uh, non-political forms of government, which are most forms of government according to Hannah Arendt, and isn't there a, a way in which the, there's a risk of the, the political becoming so diffuse that it can apply to any mm, place where a plurality of individuals gathers together and puts on display what be it. Could be in the arts. So therefore, the performing arts no longer become a metaphor, but become an instance of the political. This conference is, uh, you know, an in, would be an instance of coming to appearance. You know, so. But uh, any, you know, in the extreme, it would be any kind of discotheque or uh, fashion show or where the urge to self-display, which takes on many forms in human and animal society, uh, uh, would then conceivably be able to fall under the, the notion of the political. I believe the only way for that what Hannah Arendt would, would respond to that is that it's not any kinds of appearances, it's only very special delimited uh, appearances that have to do with the, uh, uh, not the expression, she was against the word expression, but the action of freedom, that where freedom takes on the appearance in the public realm through speech, significant speech, significant deeds, that this is uh, a coming to appearance of something that is distinctly human, has a distinctly human potential that would uh, at once relate our human experience of freedom to the natural world, but would not reduce it to that and would not equate it with that. Uh, and so to conclude, I, uh, I will say that if Hannah Arendt is right when she says that everything, nothing, and nobody exists in this world whose very being does not pre presuppose a spectator, nothing that is, insofar as it appears, exists in the singular, not man, but men inhabit this planet, uh, everything that is meant to be perceived by somebody, 
Then the question that I would leave you with is the one that haunted Erwin Schrodinger, and uh, it's what, if I may quote him, that 20th century physicist could not get his mind around the fact that <coughs> the world, the universe, the cosmos essentially, had to wait for a wholly contingent evolutionary development namely the animal brain, in order to take cognizance of itself. The animal brain facilitates the propagation and preservation of certain species, yet for millions if not billions of years, life forms maintain themselves without such contraptions, and many today still do so. In other words, many life forms do not experience appearance, are not given over to appearance. So, Schrodinger says, only a small fraction of them, if you count by species, have embarked on getting themselves a brain. And this scientific fact raises an overwhelming question for Schrodinger. Before certain creatures, in particular human beings, acquired brains, was the world a spectacle without witness? Quote, should it have been a performance to empty stalls? Can we call a world that nobody contemplates a world at all? Hannah Arendt's answer to that question is an emphatic no. But I'll, I think I'll let Schrodinger have the last word today, since as a scientist, his word on this issue carries more weight than either hers or mine. Quote, most painful is the absolute silence of all our scientific investigations toward our questions concerning the meaning and scope of the whole display. The more attentively we watch it, the more aimless and foolish it appears to be. The show that is going on obviously acquires a meaning only with regard to the mind that contemplates it. But what science tells us about this relationship is patently absurd, as if mind had only been produced by that very display that it is now watching and would pass away with it when the sun finally cools down and the earth has been turned into a desert of ice and snow. We're not going to be able to answer that question, but we do know, I think, that for Hannah Arendt, that space of freedom, which is the space of appearance, and for human action, is one that is predicated on finitude, and it doesn't have to deal with this issue about it, there having been a before and an after where it doesn't exist because that is the condition of human freedom, that it is profoundly finite in its essence. Thank you.